joint work. This is joint work um, <clears throat> with Valentin Haddad, my colleague at UCLA, and uh, Alan Marrera, who is at Rochester. Um, <clears throat> and the paper is Whatever It Takes, the Impact of Conditional Policy Promises. So let me start at kind of a high level uh, of what the paper is about. When there's a policy announcement, what we're going to argue is that the market infers not just a headline number, but infers an entire state contingent plan. And I'm going to be kind of more precise about how we're thinking about this on the next slide. What this paper is after is measuring the perception of the state contingent re response at the time that the policy announcement uh, is made. OK, so let me try and make this concrete. The main thing we're going to think about is asset purchases, but we could apply this to other policy announcements uh, as well. Let's say that the Fed makes some announcement that it's going to purchase some amount of uh, some asset. Okay, it could be corporate bonds or treasuries or whatever it is. And uh, the, the we see when right when the announcement happens, let's say using an event study, that the asset price responds pretty strongly. So think about QE during 2008, corporate bond purchases during COVID, um, wh whatever type of uh, uh, announcement you like. So there's one view which is. The headline number is sort of uh, taken at face value. So let's say they announce they're going to buy $100 billion of treasuries. You compare the price response of treasuries to the amount that they said they were going to purchase, and you use that to get some gauge of the effectiveness of the policy. So per dollar of purchases, how much does it move prices? OK. But there's a second view, which is that the announcement actually communicates a lot more than that. OK. So the, the uh, view that we're going to take is that the announcement might convey an implicit promise that the Fed is going to do a lot more if conditions worsen. Okay, And if that's the case, then the response of the price at the time the announcement's made is going to also be driven by potential policy expansion. So you could think of this as the whatever it takes view or a policy put. But basically, the market's going to infer the Fed is going to be here to backstop this market to purchase a lot more or intervene a lot more if they need to if things get worse. Okay, And that's going to have a lot of value. So part of the asset price response is going to be coming from uh, this, this policy put, if you want. That's also going to imply that future interventions are going to be priced in. The market's now expecting that the Fed will step into this market if it gets uh, into, into trouble. OK, so that's going to change asset price dynamics going forward. That's also going to mean there's going to be a weak response to subsequent announcements of the same policy. OK, and that's something that we see pretty strongly in the data. Um, and then kind of as I pointed to as well, it's going to distort the inference of policy effectiveness. You can't divide the price response by the headline number and say that's how much a dollar moves uh, asset prices, because you have this big value uh, of this um, policy put. In, in, in there too. Okay, why is this important? Well, there's a lot of debate about these promises. One debate, one uh, argument is that this is actually a useful tool. This is kind of maybe best exemplified by the Mario Draghi, whatever it takes speech, that by promising to do more if the, situation's, if the situation worsens is uh, gonna help you stabilize prices a lot uh, right now, okay? There's a criticism of the promises kind of view, which is that it can lead to moral hazard, excessive risk taking. Basically, if you know that the Fed or whatever central bank is going to step in uh, anytime things get bad, that can lead to uh, excessive risk taking and distortions. Now, most of the um, uh, work analyzing policy effects that do these event studies kind of ignore this promises uh, view. That's not because uh, we think you know, they haven't thought about it or, or whatever, but it, it, it's going to be difficult to, to measure. It's going to be difficult to pull those two things apart just from the price response alone. Um, we're going to focus on asset purchases the most, but lots of other contexts in which this could be relevant. Um, bank bailouts, yield curve or exchange rate control, uh, even expansionary fiscal policy. Um, and these promises, it's important to, to note, they could be explicit, like in the case of, of Draghi, where he explicitly said, I'll do whatever it takes or we'll do whatever it takes to stabilize things. Um, or they could be implicit, like in the corporate bond example that I gave you with the Fed. They didn't say 
uh, straight out, we're going to do whatever it takes to support this market, but the market might infer that from the announcements. Too. Okay. Okay, so how are we going to measure this and how are we going to separate those uh, views? Okay, so that's going to be the goal of the, the paper. Um, I'm going to try to provide a simple framework to, to kind of understand and quantify the impact of this state contingent policy that they might do uh, different amounts of a policy intervention depending on uh, the state of the world. Uh, I'll show you the role in the announcement returns. And the big thing for measurement for us is going to be that option prices are going to be really useful to reveal the state contingent policy impact. So while those two views I gave you before, they're both going to move the price, one of them is going to imply something for the left tail of the distribution that the other one uh, won't necessarily. Okay, And so by using option prices, we can try to gauge uh, this, these, these, these promises. The main example that I'm going to spend time on is uh, the corporate bond purchases uh, in March of 2020, where the Fed stepped in to, to purchase uh, investment-grade corporate bonds for the first time. I'm going to show you that this downside support explains at least half of the price recovery. Uh, it's going to imply much larger interventions in uh, bad states of the world. And then I'm going to show you evidence across a bunch of different announcements uh, as well. Um, quantitative easing uh, by in the US, uh, UK, uh, or by the ECB, um, purchases uh, of, of equities by the Bank of Japan, and I'll show you um, the 2008 bank bailouts uh, as well, okay? And then the last thing that I'll do is once we look at all those different announcements, and I'll try to convince you that these promises are, are, are sort of important, um, I'm going to talk about the implications for uh, market dynamics going forward. Okay, so one is this hidden risks that if the market now believes that the Fed is going to intervene into, let's say, corporate bonds every time that market gets in trouble, that's going to distort the tail risk in corporate bond markets. Okay, and I'll, I'll show you some evidence of that, that even after this uh, purchase program is over, it looks like those there's sort of too little tail risk. Um, and I'll also argue that this is going to help explain uh, a, a little bit of a puzzling pattern in, in, in the literature that there's a weakening Q, QE announcement response, that when they initially announced um, purchases of treasuries or agency MBS or, or those types of things, the response looked really, really big. For subsequent announcements, it looks uh, a lot smaller. If you have this state contingent view in mind, that's not going to be too surprising because the market already expects interventions in these bad states of the world. The announcement response uh, is, is going to look small. Now, that doesn't mean that the policy itself uh, is, is any weaker. It's just that the announcement isn't the right way to exactly measure it when it's expected. Okay. So let me focus on corporate bond purchases. So this is March 23rd, 2020. Um, the Fed announces for the first time purchases of investment grade corporate bonds. Um, the price response to this announcement was huge. Prices moved between 7 and 14%, depending on whether you use a five minute event window or allow for a couple of days for prices to respond. Uh, and that translates to somewhere between half a trillion and a trillion dollars in value, again, depending on which number you use exactly. Okay, so that's pretty big. Now, ultimately, the Fed only purchased $15 billion um, of, uh, uh, of these bonds, okay? Or corporate bonds and corporate bond ETFs between the two, okay? Um, so that would imply a really huge multiplier somewhere between 30 and 60. So is this a huge multiplier really, or is there an implicit promise communicated in this policy announcement? Okay, so here's what we're the graph that we're going to produce, and I'm going to just try to explain what this graph is communicating, and then I'll explain how we construct it. We're going to construct it using uh, option prices on investment grade corporate bonds before and after the policy announcement. That's kind of the idea. What this graph is doing, so the, the X axis here is uh, the price in three months without purchases. We're doing three months because that's when the purchases were ultimately made from the time the announcement was made, okay? And we've indexed it uh, so that 100 
means prices three months from now are equal to are the same as prices today. Okay, so that's like the current level of prices right now. Okay, we're going to think of that as sort of the state of the world absent any intervention. So if the Fed hadn't intervened, corporate bond prices could fall by 20%. That would be kind of this 80 number, or they could go up by 20%. That would be this 129. Okay, and then the y axis is the effect of purchases on prices in each one of those different states. Okay. And so what this graph is saying is if absent any intervention, corporate bond prices would have fallen by 20%, so down to this 80, the Fed would raise them by about 20%, okay? Conversely, if asset prices had rate gone up by 20%, the Fed would only raise them something like 2%, maybe 1%, okay? So there's this big asymmetry here uh, that there looks like a lot more price support in bad states of the world than good states of the world, okay? And this is going to be consistent with this uh, promises view. Okay, so let me talk about how, uh, I'll talk about a little bit of related literature, and then I'll talk about how we actually get to that graph using, uh, using option prices. Um, so long literature on asset purchase announcements. Um, this is, I'm going to like go through this super, super quickly, but we don't want to say no one has worked on this, then this is not even an exhaustive list here. Uh, and then uh, there's also a lot of work on uh, implicit policy, policy promises. So most notably, uh, the work on the Fed put, um, there's work on forward guidance as well. Uh, that that kind of has a similar flavor. And then information from option prices, I could list like 50 papers here, uh, but I'm just going to list a couple. Okay. Good. So let me talk about the framework for how we're thinking about this and then how we're going to measure this state contingent impact of policy promises. And then I'm going to spend a lot of time doing this March 2020 corporate bond announcement kind of in detail. And then I'm just going to show you um, the same methodology applied to a bunch of different policy announcements. Uh, and then I'll try and talk about these long run implications. Okay. So measuring state contingent policy. I wanna just think about a really simple example. Um, this example is gonna have uh, no promises. So the, the Fed is gonna make some announcement. Let's say it's the $100 billion of the asset that they're gonna purchase. And everyone knows that that's the exact amount that it's gonna be and no more and no less. Okay, so it's kind of just this constant purchase amount. So we're gonna have two dates, zero and one. The announcement is going to happen at date zero, and the purchases are going to happen later at date one. Okay. Before the announcement is made, the price today is going to be P0, and the price at period one is going to be P1. Okay. And so P0 is going to be uh, just the expectation of uh, P1. Well, really, this is the risk neutral expectation, right? And we're just going to ignore some kind of risk free discounting for now. Okay. So now there's an announcement that there's going to be some quantity of purchases, which I'm going to call Q. Let's say it's 100 billion or whatever the number you want is, okay? P0 is going to change when the announcement is made. So now it's going to be P0 prime. And what is that going to be? It's going to be the expectation of uh, P1 times 1 plus MQ, okay? Where M is going to be the effectiveness per unit of, uh, of policy, okay? So now this, this bottom uh, equation he, here, P0 prime minus P0 divided by P0, that's the return, announcement return of this asset, okay? And what's that going to be equal to? It's going to be equal to M times Q. M is the effectiveness per unit of policy, and Q is how much they're doing in terms of purchases. Okay. Um, we talk about this effectiveness uh, a, a lot more in, in the paper. Um, so in the paper, we have a kind of Vianos Vila style model where the Fed is gonna absorb some asset from specialists and that's gonna have some uh, multiplier or price impact and that, that justifies this uh, M, okay? Um, okay, so for example, for the corporate bond announcement that I gave you, I said that the uh, announcement response was about half a trillion to a trillion dollars. Eventually, the purchases that they made were about $15 billion. 
So that would suggest a, a multiplier M of somewhere between 30 and 60, which seems outrageously large, right? For every dollar you buy, you move the price by 30 to $60. Okay. <clears throat> now let's do the simple example with uh, promises, all right? So now the market might infer stronger interventions that the Fed will buy more than they said they would do if things get ugly, right? If conditions worsen. So now the Fed is going to buy some additional amount. I'm going to call that Q promise. If the price P1, and that's the price absent any intervention, is below some threshold P lower bar. Okay. Well, now this is going to distort the announcement uh, effect due to the presence of this extra uh, promise here. Okay. So now the announcement return P0 prime minus P0 over P0 is going to be equal to M times Q. So that's the base effect from whatever headline number they announced, let's say, plus this implicit promise uh, uh, effect, OK? Where it's going to be M times Q promise times this uh, expectation of P1 times this indicator divided by the expectation of P1. Roughly speaking, I'm just going to kind of think of that as like the probability that the promise gets exercised. It's a little bit more than that. but uh, but fine. Can I jump in with a question here? Yeah, please. So the question in the chat is, what's the right benchmark here? Would it be useful to compare intervention days to days with similar returns, but without intervention? Yeah. Uh, uh, such a comparison would help estimate the effect of the announcement uh, and distinguish it from the, a mechanical leverage effect. Yeah, good. Yeah. So, uh, uh, maybe I'll postpone that a little bit to when I talk about the standard errors, but we basically do that. Yeah. Okay. So, so we're, we could do the same thing um, on non-announcement days, right? We could do it on every single day. And then we could say, well, is it just that the return on this day was high? And every time you, do, you see the return that high, you see something like that? And the answer is no. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Great question. Um, okay. So for example, if the, uh, you know, if they're going to buy five times more in this bad state of the world, when P is below P lower bar, um, and this, what I'm going to really loosely call this probability that the promise is exercised, that you're in this bad state is something like 20%, um, that will double the announcement response, right? So now the announcement response is going to be way higher um, than it than it otherwise would have been. You would not want to conclude uh, that you know a dollar of purchases is crazy effective. You would it would be half as effective as you 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 sort of thought once you take this into account. Okay. Now, importantly as well, there's going to be no reaction at date one if this promise is fulfilled, right? Because it was already effectively priced in at the time of announcement. So that's going to be really useful too, because there is this uh, literature that initial announcements of asset purchases in the US and Europe have a puzzlingly large effect, but later stage announcements of the same policy don't. They actually seem to be really weak. Okay, This is going to sort of predict that if you get into that bad state and they do announce that they're going to buy more, nothing's going to happen in the price because it was already priced in uh, before. OK, good. So these are our two kind of like straw man views that I want you to think about. Now the question is going to be, well, how could we sort of separate this example with promises from the other one? You can already kind of tell that option prices are going to be really useful here, right? Uh, if I saw put prices with a strike of P lower bar, that's going to move differently in this case than it did in the case that I just showed you before, the no promises case. OK. Um, of course, it's not just like, the Fed could buy either Q or Q promise, right? They could buy whatever they want, depending on the different state of the world. And so now we're going to go to a more general uh, framework where there's going to be a state contingent impact of policy. And we're going to define what we're going to call a price support function G. Okay. And so now P1 prime is going to be equal to P1 times one plus G of P1. Okay. So this could now have different uh, quote unquote price support in all different states 
uh, of the world where the states of the world are indexed by P1, by what would have happened to the bond market absent any intervention. Okay, so this example I just gave you, this would be what this price support function is, the M times Q plus this indicator times the extra that they would do if um, things get bad. Okay, so this policy is not a fixed number. It's a mapping from the state of the world to this intervention. And again, the states that we're going to focus on uh, are the values of the price absent in the intervention. Now, one important thing that I'm going to note here too is we're going to extract this price support function using uh, option prices before and after the uh, announcement. But this G, this price support function, is going to be the total impact of the policy in each state. In the example that I gave you, it's, it's not going to be able to separate M and Q, how much they were buying in each state versus how effective a dollar of purchases is. Okay, We're going to need more assumptions to, to sort of try to do that. OK, so how would we recover this G from the data? Well, the problem is the announcement return gives you a, approximately uh, the expectation of G. Right. What we really want to know is what this price support function is state by state. Okay, And that's the key idea is that the option prices are going to reveal the change in the distribution from P1 to P1 prime. And that's going to allow us to back out this G. OK. Um, so that's the idea. Now, to do that, we're going to need uh, a couple of assumptions. OK, how can we recover this G for this price support? Um, and I'm going to really focus on two. Uh, the first one is the same risk neutral distribution, uh, which I'm going to call F, maps implementation date prices into announcement date prices before and after the uh, announcement. Okay, so um, roughly speaking, I think of this as like the pricing kernel between date zero and one isn't changing over the announcement. It's not making any assumption on the relation of risk neutral and physical probabilities that we can separate those. Um, we will fully allow for the pricing kernel to change when the purchases happen, that is from date one on, okay? And that's exactly what happens in uh, most of the models that we have of asset purchases. We, we show that in this Vianos Vila style model. And then I'm gonna postpone a little bit, but later I'm gonna show you supporting evidence um, that this assumption is sort of not so bad, okay? So one immediate thing is if you think the announcement changed the price of credit risk, well, if you look at high yield bonds, those didn't move at all during the announcement. Uh, if the price of credit risk changed, you would, you would have expected those to change. Okay. The second thing that we're gonna need is that the policy is what we're gonna call order preserving, okay? So the post policy price, this P1 prime that I define, is increasing in P1. Okay, and, and roughly speaking, the way I think of that is the Fed doesn't intervene so much in bad states of the world that they become relatively the good states of the world. So you're hoping, you're not hoping for the state of the world to be really, really bad because actually prices are higher in those states than they would be in quote unquote good states of the world. Okay, so there's no order flipping. Um, okay, that actually is, you know, that's going to ensure uniqueness of this G, but if we were to relax that assumption, assumption order flipping implies even more asymmetry than what we're going to document, right? If you switch a bad state into a good state, it means you have to support prices a lot in the bad state and actually negatively in the good state to, to swap them. Okay, so under assumptions one and two, option prices are going to reveal this unique uh, GFP, this unique uh, price support function. Okay. So how, how are we going to do that? Um, well, we're going to use this uh, you know classic Breeden Litzenberger uh, result that put and call prices um, across strikes can can help us reveal the distribution risk neutral distribution of course of P1 and P1 prime. Okay, and then G this price support function is just the thing that gets you from one distribution to the other. Okay. So once we see those two distributions, G is sort of whatever, it, I think of it as whatever it needs to be to get you from the first distribution to the second distribution. Okay. Um, now, since we have this order preserving policy, right, it means bad states are still bad states. So really, even though, you know, this might 
sound kind of complicated. It turns out to be really simple. Uh, it's basically just kind of matching quantize, right? I know the worst state is still the worst state. So now I just have to see what the value is the worst state before and the value is the worst state after. And G is whatever it needs to be to, to add, uh, to, to, to get you from one of those values to the other, okay? So this X percentile of P1 maps to the X percentile of P1 prime, okay? And the difference in the values is gonna give you G. Okay. Let me just give you that in a couple of examples. So here is uh, this constant policy. That's the first example that I gave you, okay? Um, where P, P prime is just gonna equal to P plus some M times Q, some constant policy thing. Well, what I'm gonna observe is these bottom two things, right? The distributions P1 before the announcement's made and P1 prime after the announcement's made. And all that's gonna happen here is a parallel shift of these. Okay, so now when I match every quantile and kind of difference the values, what am I going to get? I'm going to get a constant G. That's the top one. Okay. Other, you know, most extreme uh, example is uh, a price floor. So now um, the Fed is basically just going to say prices can't go below X. We'll buy whatever we need to to keep them from going below X. Okay, so what's the distribution is going to look like in the bottom? Well, here's the first distribution. The second one is just going to take everything below a certain value and collapse it into one point. Okay. But the rest of the distribution at the top is going to sort of remain unchanged. What G would we back out from that? Well, it would have a slope of minus one in the lower range, right? And then it would just be equal to zero in the higher range. Okay, so that's kind of the idea of how we're going to use the distributions to get this G. Okay, so that's the methodology. Let me talk about um, how we're going to do this, uh, this application to the 2020 corporate bond purchases. Okay, so here's March 23rd. The Fed announces these corporate bond purchases. I already kind of gave you these numbers about what the response is. Here's looking at this at a really high frequency. So these are using investment grade uh, and high yield corporate bond ETFs. Those are gonna be really useful because we can observe the prices instead of the underlying bonds that trade infrequently, right? We can observe the prices at super high uh, frequency. The dash line is when the announcement happens. The announcement is made, investment grade corporate bond prices spike up dramatically. Nothing happens to high yield and nothing happens to the stock market. Again, the high yield case is really interesting because it looks like it's not just oh, the credit risk premium is, is lower. Otherwise, you'd expect that to move as well, okay? Now, um, what, what I showed you that uh, investment grade corporate bond ETF, that was uh, for this ETF called LQD. It's the largest investment grade uh, corporate bond ETF issued by iShares. And there are also uh, options on that ETF, okay? And so that's what we're gonna use. So here now I'm showing you the volatility curve for um, three-month LQD options before and after the announcement, okay? So the blue is before and the red is after. Um, we've got a bunch of robustness if you're worried about, you know, liquidity of these options and, and, and all of that stuff uh, in the paper. I, I, I won't talk about that here. Um, but what you can see is overall implied volatility coming down, but kind of more shrinkage in, in the left tail, okay? What our methodology is gonna do is it's gonna translate that into this price support function uh, through the way that I've just sort of outlined already. Okay. So now we're taking those curves, we're applying that methodology that I showed you, and then here's what this G or price support function looks like, okay? Uh, and then this is in, in, in percentage. So it's the price change due to the intervention as a function of the no policy state on the X axis, okay? So again, if absent policy, uh, corporate bond prices would have fallen by 20%, the Fed would push them up by an additional 20%. So that I'm getting from this X axis value of 80, uh, the Y uh, value is about 20, okay? And you can see even more extreme um, values in the, in the left tail, okay? So this, what comes out of this looks much more like the price floor example that I gave you than it does uh, this constant policy uh, that I gave you, okay? Um, I did say I was going to talk about this, but
but uh, <laughs> the standard error bands, the, the way that we're doing those is by constructing this price support function on every other possible day when there's not an announcement happening, um, scaling it relative to the implied volatility on those days, and then uh, seeing if this, uh, you know, is sort of something that typically happens or, 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 or not. Okay, we've looked at it also on just these really high return days. Um, and, and so this seems like something specific to the announcement. Okay. Um, so that again, this left tail price support looks close to a price floor. So that kind of gener that uh, is consistent with this idea of sort of a policy put. So the blue is plotting what would it would look like if it was actually a price floor at 100. Okay, and you can see the slope in this left tail is kind of uh, similar to that. Okay, so really the value of the policy is coming from cutting off the left tail of the distribution below below some uh, amount. Okay, so now we can also do some, some cool stuff with this, at least we think so. Uh, we can say, what would the announcement return have been if instead of this black line, which was the actual price support function, um, there was constant price support for everything below the current uh, price. So for everything below 100, okay? And then we can compare what that counterfactual return would have been to what the actual return would have been. And we can say 53% um, of the announcement return comes from the extra stuff in this left tail, okay? It comes from the difference between the black and the blue in this left tail, okay? So, uh, a lot of the announcement return is coming from these conditional promises. Okay. Um, now, I also told you that this price support function, relative to our examples, it doesn't separate this M and Q, right? It doesn't separate the price impact per dollar of purchases versus how much they actual, actually purchases, act, actually purchased. Um, okay. So to do that, we we're going to need some additional assumptions. I'm going to show you two extremes. One extreme case would be, well, maybe they were just purchasing a constant amount. So this Q is constant. But it's just that the effectiveness per dollar of purchases varies wildly across states. OK? Well, if you go to that extreme, what they ultimately purchased was about 0.2% of the market cap. To get price support in these bad states of 40%, you would need the effectiveness to be about 200 in bad states of the world. So for every dollar they buy, they move the price by 200. We can debate if that's reasonable or not. I feel like that's uh, unreasonably high. It's certainly way higher than any estimate we have anywhere in the literature by many orders of magnitude. Um, the quantity view instead would say, well, let's keep this. Um, effectiveness or price impact M constant, and let's map everything to different quantities that they purchase in different states, okay? Now we can use the realized price and the realized purchase amount to then back out what the effectiveness would be. And then we could figure out the quantity that they would have bought in each state of the world, okay? And that's what this looks like down here, this, this graph in the lower left corner. Okay, so it says uh, they, they ended up being in a fairly good state. They only purchased 0.2% of the market cap, but it would be implying in these bad states of the world, they'd be implying buying something like 4 or 5% uh, uh, in terms of market cap. So that's something like $500 billion of purchases instead of $15 billion, okay? Um, and those seem like reasonable, reasonable uh, uh, numbers to us. That's what I was about to ask. Is 500 billion a plausible purchase amount? Well, they did say they did say they could purchase up to 300 billion. And Powell did say ex post. Um, so he said something very much in line with what we found ex post, which is he said, hey, the market looks pretty good right now. Uh, so we're not going to purchase that much. Presumably, they would have purchased a lot more if, if it hadn't. Now, ours would have implied, which I don't think is at all unreasonable, that if things were really, really bad, not only would they have, have exhausted the whole 300 billion, but they would have announced, we're going to actually do even more than that. Um, 
I mean, that has certainly happened with with uh, no, no, I, announcements for pleasure. treasuries okay. and things like that. And if if he if he announced he was willing to do three hundred billion, five hundred billion in an extreme save is certainly a plausible number. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 our view. Um. Okay, I don't want to talk about this too much because I want to get to other stuff, but uh, I, I did talk about this assumption um, about the, the pricing kernel around the announcements. Um, I'll just give you a couple of quick things. We already saw that high yield bonds and the stock market show no change around the announcements. So that certainly cuts against this broad um, change in the SDF uh, around the announcement. But another thing that we've done, and I'll just say this kind of quickly, um, you could have a case where the investment grade corporate bond market is highly segmented. And so the pricing kernel for an investor in that market is kind of different than it is for high yield bonds or, or, or the stock market. And there might be endogenous changes in that SDF that come through the policy announcement. Okay. Um, we have a way of, uh, uh, of, of dealing with that. Um, and basically, um, even adjusting for this kind of endogenous change in the SDF. Of course, we're making some uh, you know, assumptions about what the S that SDF looks like and how it changes. We're basically assuming that there's like a log investor in that market. Um, even adjusting for that change in the SDF, we still find kind of similar patterns. But I'm, I'm, should we surprise, should we be surprised that there's no impact on junk bonds, you know, I'm thinking, okay, we raise the prices of investment grade bonds, so mm -hmm. yields are lower. Mm -hmm. So suddenly to some fixed income investors, there might, you know, there might be some substitution into junk bonds. Um, am I thinking about yeah. this wrong or do your results imply that those markets are pretty segmented? Yeah, it's kind of weird because <laughs> on the, uh, there, there's a little bit of a tension there, right? Because the fact that those didn't move cuts against this broad SDF kind of view, but the fact that those didn't move also kind of says that probably those markets are a bit segmented because otherwise it's a little bit puzzling. Now, interestingly, they did announce that they would go into high yield bonds a few weeks later on April 9th. And then you saw the high yield bond market move like crazy but it didn't move when they announced just investment grade. So that's partly why we want to think about this like segmented markets with an endogenous uh, SDF just for investment grade bonds and that the announcement uh, might, might change that, right? Um, and so that's kind of why we're doing this, this uh, additional adjustment here. Yeah, but I agree, I agree with you. That is a little bit strange. Okay. Um, we can also go a little bit further than this and say, like, in which states was the Fed expected to buy? So far, I've kind of pushed towards uh, low price states for corporate bonds, right, when the, when the corporate bond market crashes. But that can come from multiple channels, right? One is just the risk-free rate might be changing. The second is that the credit risk premium might be changing. And then a third one is that there might be strong dislocations in uh, those corporate bonds. So just think about that as movements of what, you know, uh, beyond anything from risk premiums or fundamental value or anything like that. So how could we try to decompose that a little bit? Well, we're going to get options on 10-year treasury futures, and we're going to get options on uh, the investment grade CDS index. And then we're going to define these dislocations as the CDS bond uh, basis. Okay, now what we really want is this joint distribution between uh, the treasury futures and the CDX index. Um, we're gonna we're gonna kind of combine those using some uh, copula methods and and obviously have to make some uh, assumptions to 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 do that. Um, but we still think that that's that's informative to look at. And here's what ends up happening. So here's the distribution. Um, before that's in the solid line and after that's in the dash line and what it really looks like is that the intervention shrinks the left tail of the basis of those dislocations okay 
So the strongest intervention is going to be in states where not only are corporate bond prices really low, but they're way lower than they should be relative to what uh, the CDS market would be telling you. Okay, and then here's this quote from Powell that kind of seems to square with that. Uh, in June, after the purchases were all made, he said, markets seem to be functioning pretty well, so purchases are going to be at the bottom end of the, the range that we were thinking of. Okay. Oh, I've only got like 10 minutes, eight minutes. So let me do this uh, promises everywhere. So now that I've kind of done the deep kind of case study on um, corporate bonds during COVID, we're just gonna apply the same methodology to a bunch of other announcements, okay? So I mentioned this extension to high yield on April 9th of 2020. Um, this October 13th, 2008, that's the Paulson plan. So equity injections into the financial sector. Uh, purchases by the Bank of Japan, all the U.S. quantitative easing events, or the, the ones that seem to really move markets the most, and then a bunch of ECB announcements, okay? Now, the, the option prices that we're using for each one of these announcements um, is going to be different depending on, you know, what the appropriate reference is. So for uh, the Paulson plan, for example, we're going to use options on the uh, financial sector ETFs. Uh, for the U.S. quantitative easing ones, we're going to use options on treasury futures, right? So it's going to kind of depend on which is the asset that we think is most relevant in question. And then this, this uh, second column here is um, that fraction that's explained by the promises. So the fraction that's explained by extra support in the left tail that I gave you uh, before, okay? And so there's varying degrees across these different things. Um, but on average, it looks like roughly 18% uh, or so um, of the announcement returns are explained by these uh, uh, promises, by the additional stuff in the left tail. Okay, um, so we have the plots of each one of these in the paper if you're, if you're curious. Um, I'll maybe talk about this one. This is uh, the Paulson plan in October of 2008. So the announcement was equity injections in the banking sector, uh, plus some guarantees on bank debt. And then we're going to use options on this financial sector ETF. Okay, that's kind of the relevant um, uh, benchmark there. Um, and then this is kind of all consistent with this uh, Paulson's gift paper by uh, uh, Pietro and Luigi that the the communication was that they were ready to intervene much more uh, to ensure the survival of banks. So that's why you see this kind of asymmetric effect um, going on here. Okay, so then we have um, USQE. This is November of 2008 on the left. We do the taper tantrum as well. So that's an interesting case because it's kind of like taking away this price support. Um, and so we see the reverse effect there, right? An upward sloping instead of a downward sloping. Uh, price support. But if you're interested, all these different plots are, are in the paper. Okay, so let me now talk about like the implications of this uh, promises view. The first one that I'm going to show you is that um, asset prices can be distorted even when there's no intervention. And then the second one, I've already alluded to this, uh, is that you're going to get a weakening announcement response. But that does not mean that the uh, policy effectiveness itself is, is weakening. Okay, so let me talk about this asset prices being distorted just really briefly. Are corporate bond prices going to be distorted after the intervention is over? Well, if markets still think that any time, now that they've already done this once, any time that the corporate bond market crashes, the Fed is going to intervene, you might uh, uh, think that's going to distort markets. So now there's going to be a challenge, though, is relative to sort of what benchmark. I'm going to show you kind of really quickly a couple of things here. Um, the first, maybe I'll just focus the most on this one. Corporate bond tail risk looks far less sensitive to equity market tail risk after these interventions have been made than it used to. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll also show you a little bit about these spreads, credits, actual credit spreads versus these pseudo spreads from uh, equity options. This is again from. Um, this Kolp Nozawa uh, Veronese paper, if you know that paper. Okay, so here's corporate bond and stock market tail risk. Okay, so we 
come up with this, uh, you know, it's a it rough proxy for uh, tail risk. This is the slope of the implied volatility uh, curve effectively for corporate bonds on the left-hand side. And I'm regressing that on tail risk measured using S&P 500 options, okay? And then I have an interaction term. The interaction term is uh, after the interventions are all over. So June of 2020 onward, okay? And what you see is these two tail risk measures used to be highly correlated, right? So the slope coefficient is about 0.6. But in this post period, so after the intervention, it's large and negative, almost completely, well, it does actually completely offset or kill the, the, the um, correlation between the two. Okay, so those two things used to move a lot together and now they effectively don't move together at all. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll skip this one in the interest of time. And then just also show you this corporate bond spreads versus uh, these pseudo spreads. So remember the pseudo spreads, if you if you know that AER paper, are constructed using equity index options. Okay. And the black line here is actual investment grade credit spreads. Okay. The two of them before 2020 moved pretty well together, right? That 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 was uh this this AER paper kind of showing that you could. Uh, extract a lot about credit spreads from using equity options. But since 2020, the pseudo spreads remain really high, but actual credit spreads are really low. Okay. And our understanding of that is going to be well, actual credit spreads are really going to be strongly pricing in um, this, this uh, future intervention into corporate bond markets. Okay. Um, so those results support the belief of future purchases in the case of a crash. Now, one other thing that you might expect is if that's the case, whoops, if that's the case, um, what should companies do? They should be invest, they should be issuing a lot of investment grade debt, right? Because it, since it's essentially underpriced. Um, and that is exactly what we've seen. Okay, so since these announcements were made, there's been a really big explosion in investment grade debt issuance relative to high yield or relative to where things were at before the uh, interventions. Okay. Oh, I got like one minute. So let me just say for one minute, this weakening QE uh, announcement effects. Okay. Uh, so again, implication of this view is that markets are gonna react really strongly to initial QE announcements right? Because they're going to bake in this uh, value of the policy put or that the, the central bank is going to intervene more if things get uglier. And they're going, to, they're going to respond much less to subsequent announcements because they're already pricing in that you're going to do more stuff in bad states, okay? That accords really well with this literature that finds um, <clears throat> yield responses to the initial announcements were really, really big and yield responses to later announcements were really small. So that's true in the US and the UK, that's true for the ECB uh, uh, as well. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I will just say though, that does not mean that the policy itself is weakening, right? The announcement weakening doesn't mean the policy is weakening if people are baking in uh, the future interventions. Okay. Um, so certainly markets are sort of behaving as if these asset purchase policies are 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 here to stay, which we think is uh, which we think is reasonable. All right. Oh, I had stuff about the UK. I'm not. You, you, say. Have, you have a couple more minutes. Okay. A uh, couple more minutes. So. Um, no, that's fine. You know what? I'll 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 I think I'll conclude and maybe maybe take. Uh, I want. I definitely want to allow time for questions. Um, okay, so let me let me wrap up here. So, the main goal of the paper: measuring the state contingent impact of policy announcements. Um, a pretty easy to implement method um, using option prices. Uh, main main finding: markets systematically perceive promises when central banks step into asset markets. Uh, the thing I spent the most time on was corporate bonds. 
during March of 2020. Um, there, there was way more price support in bad states of the world. That had a huge impact on the announcement effect. At least 50% was coming from extra stuff they were doing in the uh, left tail. And then after um, that announcement is made, it looks like there's persistently lower crash risk that is priced into corporate bonds. And it looks like corporate bond yields are actually pretty low. So uh, even though that program has been over for a really long time, markets look like they now kind of think if things get bad, the Fed will step into corporate bonds. Um, certainly they've done that for treasuries, right? For QE, uh, that has, you know, um, um, they, they stepped back in during 2020. Uh, there was QE one, two, three, uh, so it, it seems reasonable that that the markets can expect um, once once the Fed implements this policy that they will continue to implement it. Um, and then I showed you some evidence uh, across a bunch of different announcements: uh, quantitative easing for Treasuries, support for the financial system. Um, we have asset purchases by the Bank of Japan. We're always looking for new announcements to sort of incorporate uh, here as well. If you have suggestions of those. Um, that would be great. Uh, so thanks very much. And uh, I'm happy to take uh, take any questions that anyone has. So anyway, so now is the time uh, we invite anyone in the audience to unmute him or herself and ask questions using their microphone. You know, you know, just if you have a question, just feel free to shout it out. Uh, while you're thinking about questions, I have one comment and one question of my own. So the one comment is, you know, it's kind of very unfortunate um, that this, you know, one-time policy announcement seems to have a permanent impact that has created this expectation of, you know, future bailouts in the corporate bond market. That's not really a comment about your paper, just about reality or what appears to be reality. But my question is, um, so, so you your analysis is a one period model. Yeah. And actually, I, I'm not sure I caught it. You must have said it, but I'm not sure I caught it that you must use options with a particular time to maturity. Yes. But what I'm worried about or what I'm thinking about is, you know, maybe the Fed's intervention will be more like a barrier option, right? That they yep. intervene if prices drop at any time in the yep. next X months. Totally so agree. Why should I think that your conclusions, so you made a simplifying assumption, you're looking at options at a particular time horizon. Mm -hmm. And should I worry about how the fact that the conclusions would, you know, things might be a little bit different if we if you thought about it in terms of a barrier option i think the short answer is uh yes <laughs> we we worry about that so so really i like this example that you said which is like they'll just intervene no matter like anytime the price falls below x maybe at any point in the next year right so we used a maturity of three months because that, for the corporate bonds at least, that is when the announcement happened, it was in March. When the purchases happened, they were about three months later. Mm -hmm. But you're totally right that like this two period model is really not quite the way to think about it, especially when I've shown you the long-term evidence that it looks like even after this thing's over, they're still pricing in that they might intervene, right? And the our challenge was we didn't have we we still don't have a good way to fully separate that. One thing that we've thought maybe one natural thing is to try to use um, some term structure to use options with different maturities. The problem that we ran into there was there's not that much for these corporate bond ETFs for the options on them. There's nothing liquid enough that we were comfortable with that's reasonably long term. Um, but yeah. I, yeah, another, another way to think about it is like, when I showed you the price support for those high states, 
that is still even incorporating, that doesn't necessarily mean that they would buy that much in those states to move the prices that much, but it means that the sort of like subsidy that they're pr providing, the present value of the subsidy that they're providing for all dates going forward in that state is that number. Yeah, I understand, yeah. And so, so one weird thing that we got is when we equated, when we backed out the state that you ended up landing in three months from now and how much they purchased, and we tried to square those with a price impact, we still got a number that looked way too high to us. It was about eight, better than 200. But we think eight is pretty high relative to other estimates that people have come up with. Yeah, I mean, even, even probably still, a lot of that is coming from we're mixing in the value of future interventions still. So, yeah, that that's a tricky issue, and I don't know if you have suggestions on how we could better separate that. Well, I think to better, I think to separate it you'd have to take a stand on a model, which I don't yeah. necessarily encourage that you do. You know, if you, if you took a stand and said, Heston's stochastic volatility model is the right mm -hmm. model, then maybe with a lot of work, you could separate it. Or if you said local volatility model is the right model, then you could do it. Yeah. But then you get a set of questions, you know, yeah. oh, Professor Muir, why, do you, why should we think this is the right model? Yep. So you, then you get then you get stuck with a different set of problems. Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. Yeah, but no, but you're up. You're absolutely right on that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've been dominating this. Does anyone else have a question? Feel free to ask your questions. Last chance to ask your question. Last chance to tell Tyler is wrong. I mean, uh, it would be interesting. Are there any events where the central banks start to unwind in their bond positions and make announcements about those? So that should have like somewhat asymmetric effect, not fully, yeah. but somewhat. Would it be interesting to look at those? Are there any like like this treasury accumulating QE assets and then dumping some of them? Yeah. So the, on the only one we have on that is the uh, taper tantrum in June of 2013. But that's exactly what they did. They said they're going to unwind all this stuff. And we can, so we have that announcement in there. And there you see, instead of this like downward sloping asymmetric thing, you see something upward sloping, right? Like there was a promise in there and it was like sort of taken away. So you see the, the mirror image sort of effect there. Yeah, that's the only one of those that we have right now, though. Um, I'm not aware of any other ones that we could that we could potentially use. And your estimates are kind of also the low bound because uh, presumably even before the intervention, the market kind of expected some kind of yeah. intervention. Yeah. Yeah. If you okay. think they if you think they were already expected expecting some kind of intervention, I think the corporate bond one was uh was still pretty surprising. Um, but there I think there were some rumblings about it a couple of days before that maybe they might do this. But yeah, you're right, you're right. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, 